a historical uh, view of um, uh, cholesterol lowering, LDL cholesterol lowering, and um, the evidence uh, of, of the causal association and um, the benefits of lowering cholesterol and safely doing so. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a, as I say, a historical um, description, but I hope to get to the present day before you kick me out. Um, this is data from 1980s, uh, looking at the association between um, uh, average cholesterol levels in um, different populations across the world and the incidence of coronary heart disease mortality uh, in those different populations. Um, and it uses the US units, but uh, for those who are familiar with the, the European units, you divide by 14, so this is 5 millimoles per litre, 4 millimoles per litre, 3 millimoles per litre. Um, and what this study showed was a strong association between the level of cholesterol uh, and the incidence of coronary heart disease mortality. Uh, now, it, it says that this was estimated, and this is a, um, a, a replotting of those data um, on a doubling scale over here. Uh, and that was quite important to be like statistical manipulation, because what it did was it showed that for these data, I think you want that light off, actually, um, for these data, there is this log linear association. So populations with a lower cholesterol had a lower risk, and per millimole lower cholesterol, there was about a halving in risk in these different populations. Now the problem with this kind of thing is that people in different populations differ in all sorts of other ways. So maybe this is just a, um, a casual rather than a causal association, and it is really reflecting other differences between those populations. So from an epidemiological point of view, much better studies are studies done within populations. <clears throat> and what this slide shows uh, is a combination of all of the data from about 60 uh, pr prospective cohorts where people had their cholesterol measured uh, in these different studies and they were followed on average for about 12 years. And then we've combined all of the data from all of those studies. Now, in this analysis, we're avoiding comparisons between different populations. We're looking within a population, um, combining the data from these different studies within a population to look at the association between cholesterol, now I'm onto European units, and the risk of uh, coronary heart disease mortality. And again, we see this log linear association. Um, and because we've got so much data, we can look at the association uh, at different ages of death from coronary heart disease. We see a much steeper association at younger age than at older age. So in relative terms, cholesterol is more strongly related with risk in younger people. But of course, older people have a higher absolute risk of coronary heart disease mortality. And so uh, the difference between the lowest group and the highest group um, at older age, in relative terms, is less, but in absolute terms, is much greater than the association <clears throat> at young age. But in all cases, we're seeing this long linear association. Now, that's a, quite a surprising observation for many people, because most people have in their mind, um, with a lot of risk factors, be it cholesterol or with blood pressure, that there is a threshold above which they become important risk factors. And if I were to plot this on a normal scale, not the doubling scale, that's exactly what you'd see. You see a curvy linear association. And there would be a point at which it seems like the curve is taking off. And that's what you might de define as hypercholesterolemia, or if you're talking about blood pressure, hypertension. But in fact, uh, it's a misleading view of the data. Because if you plot it on this doubling scale, there is no point at which the risk takes off. It's log linear. Um, and so the same absolute difference in cholesterol is associated with the same proportional difference in risk throughout the range studied. Um, and we've done studies in Asian populations, particularly in rural China uh, and urban China, that suggest 
um, that these log linear associations continue down below the levels that we typically see in the West. And it was that observation that led us to uh, um, this cartoon, uh, essentially saying that if you're thinking about lowering cholesterol, um, then you don't want to lower cholesterol in people who have high cholesterol. You want to lower cholesterol in people who have high risk. Because you're not actually interested in their cholesterol level per se, you're interested in lowering their risk. And you could have somebody who has a, a relatively low cholesterol level, but they're at high risk because of other factors. Maybe they've already had a heart attack, maybe they've already had a stroke, perhaps they have diabetes or hypertension, that puts them at high risk. And you could get the same absolute reduction in risk that you would get in the average risk population among people who have just high cholesterol. Now, that's quite a revolutionary concept. It goes against all the things that doctors do. Doctors, when you go and see your GP, they measure your blood pressure, and they say your blood pressure is high, we'll lower it. Or they measure your cholesterol, they say your cholesterol is high, we'll lower it. But that's not the point. You're interested in lowering risk. And if this log linear association is true, um, then one would anticipate that you could take people who are at high risk with a comparatively low or maybe so-called normal cholesterol level for the West. And they would be the ones that would be worth intervening in uh, by giving, say, drugs or dietary change to lower that risk. And that was what we set out to test over the next 20 years based on these observational epidemiological studies. But the starting point was to look to see what had happened in the previous trials of old drugs prior to the introduction of the statin drugs. Um, uh, so the statins were a new class of drugs that really became available for uh, clinical research in the early 1990s. Um, they're called statin because all of the drug names end in statin. They're HMG coA reductase inhibitors. They inhibit an enzyme in the cells that's involved in the production of cholesterol within particularly liver cells. By blocking that enzyme, you reduce the amount of cholesterol in the liver cell. The liver cell thinks, hey, where's all the cholesterol going? I need more cholesterol. And it pushes more LDL cholesterol receptors, or generates more LDL cholesterol receptors, and puts them on the liver cell surface, which then drags uh, LDL cholesterol out of the blood into the liver where it's metabolized and excreted. So the statins or the HMV and coA reductase inhibitors work by tricking the liver into thinking there's a shortage of cholesterol, increasing the number of LDL receptors on the surface, and dragging it out of the blood and reducing the LDL cholesterol level in the blood. But before those agents became available, there were also there were a number of different ways in which one could lower uh, cholesterol, Not a, none of them very effective. You could try diets. Um, people found it very difficult to stick to diets that lower their cholesterol. You could try some of the older drugs. There were resins, which were um, like drinking sand. Uh, so you would get a great big beaker full of this kind of sandy, gritty, um, usually flavored uh, liquid, which you would have to drink a lot of to try to lower your cholesterol a little bit. And there were other drugs, such as clopidogrel and other fibrate drugs. Um, the problem with them was they didn't lower cholesterol very much. And then a lot of relatively small trials were done of those old drugs. And if you combined all of the data, then it did look as if um, lowering cholesterol in these trials by about 10% on average produced a reduction in the risk of death from coronary heart disease. So the odds of dying, if you got the treatment versus the odds of dying if you didn't, was 0.72, so uh, the reciprocal, a 28% reduction in mortality from coronary heart disease with a confidence interval that didn't overlap one, didn't overlap no effect. So there was a significant reduction in coronary mortality. However, in those trials, there appeared to be increases, and increased odds of death if you got the cholesterol lowering treatment um, from cardiac causes, from cancer, from injury, and other causes. And it was very difficult to unpick whether that was real or not. Um, some of the associations were significant, statistically, in that it didn't overlap 
uh, the no effect won. Some of them were not significant. Um, and there was a lot of controversy around uh, whether or not uh, cholesterol lowering with these drugs or diet um, was beneficial. And uh, a British Medical Journal paper in 1992 uh, that uh, reported this uh, concluded it's difficult to justify the general use of cholesterol lowering drugs when the data available from the clinical trials fail to show reductions and may show increases in mortality. Uh, translated into uh, murders linked to low fat drugs, so that was the observation that there were more deaths from, from trauma. Um, uh, aggressive, suicidal, your healthy low cholesterol be to, be to blame, so increases in suicide. Um, my favorite, bacon bad for the heart, the good for the soul. Uh, and then um, in the, the medical uh, kind of throwaway um, journals, um, this controversy as to whether or not to lower cholesterol. So Richard Pito, uh, my colleague uh, at that time, um, drew, drew this figure, uh, and, and I found the old slide and, and, and uh, copied it, uh, from February 1988, so this was unpublished. And, um, he took all of these old trials that I've just shown you, and plotted the reduction in the odds of coronary heart disease, so zero reduction, 60% reduction, and the confidence intervals for each of these trials, and plotted the regression line through these results. The, the squares are proportional to the amount of information, the number of, of deaths. Um, and he said, well, what would happen if we had a drug that produced not a 10% average reduction in cholesterol, but a 25% reduction in cholesterol, which is what the statins could do. What, what might we hope to see if we had a trial of, say, five or six years, so the average time to the event would be about uh, three years? Well, based on this regression, we might expect to see something like um, a 40% reduction in um, the risk of coronary heart disease mortality if we could lower uh, cholesterol um, by around um, one and a half millimoles per liter. So that was a prediction before any of the trials. Um, <coughs> supporting evidence for that perhaps being real came not from drug or from diet, but actually from a very interesting surgical trial. Um, so this was a trial that uh, used ileal bypass surgery to lower cholesterol. Um, and what's interesting about it is, is two things. One, it produced a big reduction in cholesterol, really the first trial of a large reduction in LDL cholesterol, a 1.6 millimole reduction, the kind of reduction that one could get with a statin. Um, but we've got no statin trials at that point. Um, and the second thing, of course, is that the compliance is good. Uh, it's not like a tablet that you have to keep taking each day. This was surgery, you had it, we didn't have it, and it wasn't in reverse. So we're now looking here at the effects of a very long-term um, reduction in LDL cholesterol. And over a 12-year period, there was a high significant reduction um, in, the, uh, in the events, in the coronary uh, death, or MI, myocardial infarction heart attack. So you, again, the, the previous trials suggested that the statins might well produce um, uh, valuable effects on coronary heart disease and, and um, myocardial infarction. Uh, but there was still the uncertainty as to whether there would be hazards would we see um, not only bigger reductions in coronary artery coronary heart disease mortality and heart attacks, but would we see bigger increases in um, other causes of death? So, before any of the trials um, were completed, we uh, were in contact with all of the different investigators, and we got them to agree to, once they published their results, to, com to provide their individual data from each of the trials, so that we could combine those trials together in order to get more reliable information about efficacy and safety. Um, so for each trial, for each patient in each trial, we got information about which treatment they were allocated, some information about their baseline characteristics, and then uh, details about uh, vascular events that occurred, heart attacks, strokes, cause specific mortality, and because of uh, anxieties that lowering cholesterol might affect cancer, uh, site-specific cancer. 
In the end, by um, 2010, uh, there had been 26 trials of 130,000 patients randomized to either get a statin or to get a placebo, a dummy tablet. Uh, and so this was, these were blinded studies. You couldn't, the patient and the doctors couldn't tell which group the, um, the patient was in. On average, in those trials, there was about a one millimole difference at one year, probably a bit less as non-compliance increased over the five-year period of the trials, uh, which was the average follow-up. And then subsequent to these trials, there were trials that um, followed on from them, because individual trials here showed benefit, to look to see whether more intensive therapy, lowering cholesterol more with bigger doses of statin or with different statins, produced further reductions in risk. And in those trials, there was an average half a millimole further reduction in cholesterol, and again, they went for about five years. I'll just take a minute on this figure, um, because I'm going to show a few like this. Uh, and the, the format is, uh, in this case, there are the different kinds of outcome, uh, but it may, I may also show some with different subgroups, uh, so young, old, or people um, with different levels of risk. Um, here are the numbers of events in the statin group, number of events in the control group, the relative risk in the treatment group plus control, so a relative risk of 0.74 would mean a 26% reduction in non-fatal myocardial infarction, with a range of uncertainty, so 95% probability that this range encompasses uh, the truth. Uh, so um, we can be pretty certain that the effect is somewhere between a 30% and a 20% reduction in the risk of non-fatal MI. And that's plotted over here, so that same relative risk is plotted over here. And what you can see is that if we take all of these different kinds of major vascular events, that is coronary events, non-fatal heart attack or coronary death, revascularization procedures such as coronary artery bypass surgery, or angioplasty, so opening up the artery with a balloon, um, or ischemic stroke, so strokes due to blood clots, um, then we see a very similar reduction of about one quarter, one, sorry, about one fifth of one quarter in the risk of these events per one millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol in the transostatin versus control. There's one exception, hemorrhagic stroke, um, is slightly but not significantly adverse. There is some other data to suggest that there may be a real small increase in hemorrhagic stroke with statin therapy. The, the size of the square here is proportional to the number of events. So the big squares are really showing you where the large amount of information is. And these kinds of plots are used a lot in the analysis and the presentation of, of clinical trial data because they can summarize a lot of, a lot of information uh, quite succinctly. So here's another such plot. This is now looking at the time to event. So we're looking at major vascular events by time from entry into the trial. So these are people typically who run their cholesterols for about 40 years, 50 years, and then they are randomized to getting a reduction in cholesterol or no reduction in cholesterol. Within a year, we're seeing a reduction in risk. Um, but it's only a relatively small reduction in risk, about a 12% reduction in risk. Among people who've not had an event um, by the beginning of the, of the next year, uh, we're seeing a reduction which is somewhat bigger, about twice as big, a reduction of about a quarter. And then in each subsequent years, we're seeing a further reduction in the quarter. So the curves are getting further and further apart. Um, as we continue to give treatment, we get more and more uh, reduction in risk. Out here, the effect seems to be getting smaller, but that may well be due to increasing non-compliance, people uh, stopping taking their study treatment. This is looking at these data in another different way. So instead of looking by time, we're looking at people who are at different levels of risk of having an event over the next five years. Uh, and, and this picture 
is the one that's generating quite a lot of controversy in the press recently. Um, because it is the basis for the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence, NICE, for recommending, uh, where he's putting out the consultation and recommendation, the, the level of risk at which doctors um, could prescribe statins um, would be lower uh, than it currently is. Uh, so at the moment, um, statins are recommended and provided on the NHS to people in these groups. Uh, um, uh, but the evidence here is that we have a significant reduction in the risk of major mass events, even among people at lower risk than the current guidelines recommend starting therapy. And when we combine that with the substantial reduction in the cost of these drugs, because they've now become generic, uh, it turns out to be cost effective for the NHS to offer um, this treatment to patients in these lower risk groups. That doesn't mean they should take it, only that from the NHS's point of view, uh, it looks to be a, a cost-effective intervention um, that could be offered uh, to patients. Uh, but what you can see is that the proportional reduction is at least as great in the lower risk groups as in the higher risk groups, um, although there is somewhat less data. And of course, the lower risk patients are at lower risk, uh, so their absolute benefit will be somewhat smaller. And then in terms of cancer, um, so very large numbers of different kinds of cancers have been observed in these trials during the five years of the, trial, uh, of the trials, and there's no evidence of any significant increase in any particular cancer, which was very reassuring. And in certain of the trials, particularly in the UK, where we can link the patients into national uh, record systems, we've been able to show that even after about 10 to 15 years, there's no evidence of any emerging trend towards an increase uh, in cancer uh, with lowering cholesterol. <coughs> so what's been happening recently is a bit like going back in time. Uh, the, this, a, a new controversy has emerged um, around whether there are side effects associated with um, statins that would outweigh the benefits. Um, and it's certainly true that patients who get um, given statins do report um, adverse events, uh, things that happen, you happen to them, uh, and that they attribute um, to, often to the statin, and they stop the statin as a consequence of that. Um, and this has been interpreted, misinterpreted, as evidence that, that causal side effects are occurring in a very large portion of patients. So here are two articles from the British Medical Journal. Uh, side effects in 20% participants, 18% uh, risk of causing side effects that range from minor and reversible to serious and irreversible. And the report that they're citing is this one here. So this was a study where um, they were looking at a big database um, where 57,000 of, of uh, 107,000 patients uh, were found to have discontinued their statin, at least temporarily. And they, they wanted to find out what were the reasons given for stopping the statin, and it, was it likely that that reason um, was a good reason? Was it a misattribution or was it an appropriate attribution or causation? So they found statin-related events, um, so ev events that the patient or the doctor attributed to the statin in uh, nearly 19,000 of these uh, patients, so 17%. Uh, percent. So that's where those percentages on the previous slide come from. Um, and then the statin was discontinued at least temporarily by 11,000 of these. So this is being interpreted as the, the side effect. Now, to know whether it's causal, one of the things that you would, might well do is um, stop it for a while, then give the patient the statin again, and see if the, uh, um, the symptoms recur and they have to stop the statin. But when, they, when that was uh, done, 92% of the patients who were rechallenged really 
were still taking a statin 12 months later. So it, it appeared from that report that um, the statins uh, uh, were not causally related, uh, that rechallenging did not produce a recurrence of the event. And so the conclusion of the paper was quite different from the previous slide in that it said this supports the hypothesis that many statin related events reported in observational studies may not be caused by these medications. Now that's an opinion. Um, it may or may not be. Uh, so, you know, how can we test this uh, more uh, rigorously? Well, we can go to the randomized controlled trials that demonstrate the, the efficacy on vascular events of lowering cholesterol. Because in those trials, they didn't just record did people die uh, or did they have heart attacks or strokes. They recorded all of the reasons why patients stop taking uh, treatment. Um, and they also recorded all sorts of other adverse events that occurred during that trial. And remember, they were recording this not knowing whether the patient was taking the active drug or a dummy tablet. So unlike the previous study, where the doctor and the patient knew they were taking a tablet um, and could therefore attribute it to the tablet, in this case, the patient could attribute things to the tablet but they didn't know whether they were attributing it to the real drug or to a dummy. And one of the most common reasons in that previous slide for uh, attributing um, adverse events to the drug was myalgia, muscle aching. And it would, but if we look in randomized trials, actually slightly more, not significantly more, but slightly more patients given the dummy tablet than the active tablet reported myalgia. So in the blinded trials, there was no excess of myalgia. Now, that was 40% of the statin-related events in the previous study were myalgia. So one of the most common reasons that was uh, used as the attribution, there's no significant difference between people getting the real tablet and the dummy tablet. Myopathy. Now, we do know from non-randomized data that you see a small increase in wealth. It's a very, very rare event, um, and uh, you can, uh, when you do re-challenge, you do see recurrence, but, the, but um, the rate is very, very low. We see significant increases in elevations of liver enzymes, um, but no other excesses in any other adverse event was observed in the randomized controlled trials. So the, the true uh, side effect rate with statins is about a 1 per 10,000, not a 20%, but a 1 per 10,000 increase in the risk of myopathy. This is where you get big increases in uh, muscle enzyme release into the blood uh, associated with muscle pain or muscle weakness. If you don't stop the statin and you allow that to continue on, then the muscle breakdown um, can result in damage to the kidneys um, and you go into rhabdomyolysis, which can be fatal. Uh, and indeed, uh, one of the statins was uh, withdrawn from the market uh, because the dose that they were using in normal practice was so high that they were getting high rate, higher rates than this of myopathy and rhabdomyolysis. Um, but typically, we're talking about a rate of about 1 per 10,000. The randomized controlled trials, when combined, also um, demonstrated a small increase in the diagnosis of diabetes. So in a prime prevention trial called JUPITER, they observed a significant increase in diabetes, a relative risk of 1.26, so a, an increase of about one quarter, which was statistically significant. So the confidence interval does not overlap the no effect line. That is one. On the basis of that, uh, a group up in Glasgow, the Satellis group and uh, David Priest, uh, obtained the data from all the uh, other trials um, that they could get hold of uh, on diabetes and combined the data. And overall, there looked to be about a 10% proportional increase in diabetes. So there are, those are the two demonstrated side effects. Uh, but really very uh, low prevalence. So if we were to take 
the lowest risk groups in the slide I showed you earlier of people who are below the level of risk at which NICE currently recommends statins, um, then uh, if you treat it for five years, you would get 11 fewer vascular events, about half, or if you want, per 2,000, one per 2,000, 22 per 2,000, uh, and 10 per 2,000 more diagnoses of diabetes. Um, now, the main concern about diabetes is it increases your risk of vascular events, but of course we already know that this treatment is reducing vascular events. If it didn't do this to diabetes, then we might have got a slightly bit bigger benefit. And if you accept my assertion that the totality of the evidence suggests there may be an increase in hemorrhagic stroke, about half or one per 2,000 increase in hemorrhagic strokes, but again, that is included in this benefit here. Um, so, even for the lower risk groups, the benefit is about 10 times as big um, as the, 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 the demonstrated side effects. And these are benefits that persist. So this is a trial that, that we ran in the UK, five years of treatment, and then we, um, the treatment in the two groups becomes the same, um, but people don't know which group they were in. Uh, and then we've linked, we've followed them up over the next five years. So you can see that having a one millimole lower cholesterol for five years produces a benefit increasing over time. And then, although the treatment is no longer different, that benefit persists. If the treatment had continued in this group and not continued in that group, this curve would have gone up like that and we would have got even further divergence. Year on year, you get further reduction in risk. But um, I've been talking about the benefits. What about the, the side effects? So the, the regulator for the UK is called the uh, MHRA, the Medicines and... Um, uh, I forget. Uh, um, so they regulate regulatory authority, the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority, um, which regulates drugs and determines what's in the data sheet. And in November 2009, they added a whole series of alleged side effects um, to the data sheet. Sleep disturbance, memory loss, sexual disturbance, depression, uh, interstitial neuropathy. These are not things that are really uh, going to encourage patients to take the treatment. Um, and the question is, are they real? Well, it's difficult to summarize a full report, but just to take one of the things that they added to the data sheet, uh, stat, the effects of statins on memory loss. These are drugs that have been used and are being used by tens of millions of people um, around the world. In the UK, um, in this review, they, this, they reviewed 333 cases of memory loss, which have been reported post-marketing. And they said, well, they couldn't rule out a causal relationship between sympathetic and memory loss. Well, but they couldn't rule it in either. Um, they looked at the randomized trials of sympathetic versus placebo control. They looked at the placebo control trials of pravastatin and other statin versus control. And none of those trials was there a difference in memory loss between the people who got the real drug or the placebo, and yet they added it to the data sheet. You'd have to ask why they would do that. I mean, it's not really based on science. The, these are the scientific data, so um, in a number of the trials, uh, because there had been all sorts of claims, um, memory loss and cognitive function were assessed systematically in those trials. Here is the trial we ran. Um, uh, we did a very simple measure of uh, memory, um, but you can see that the scores, the people have a low score, uh, is very strongly correlated with age. So as you get older, your scores get worse, the memory gets worse. So it's clearly very sensitive um, to uh, picking up that deterioration with age, but despite that sensitivity, there's no difference 
between those who've got uh, the statin and those who've got the dummy tablets, indicating the sensitive test of, of memory um, was not able to detect any difference between um, the people who got the drug or the placebo. A very much more detailed set of um, analyses were done in a trial called PROSPER in Scotland um, uh, and in, in Scandinavia uh, that studied elderly patients, so um, uh, nearly 6,000 patients aged 70 to 82 at baseline. They did a whole series of different um, uh, memory tests. It, it, it's not worth knowing what these are, but other than to say there is no significant difference between these various uh, measures of uh, memory and cognitive function, um, the trends were, if anything, slightly in favor of the treatment group rather than against. So actually, the control data we have provides no support whatsoever of putting memory loss into the data sheet. And that is true of all of the uh, things that the MHRA put in. And yet we get more. So this is a, another study um, based on a huge database of people being treated with statins in routine practice um, and asking the question, uh, what are the rates of disease among the people who got the statin versus the people who didn't? So we're now moving away from a controlled experiment where we have people on dummy tablets and on real tablets and where we've randomly allocated the patients to those different treatment regimens so we know they differ only randomly with respect to all their risk factors. Um, here we've got people who get a statin and people who don't get a statin who may differ systematically from each other. Doctors give drugs to particular patients for a good reason. The ones who get the drugs may well be quite different from the ones who don't. But you can't measure all of those differences, so you can't necessarily adjust for the impact of all of those differences, however big your computer, however clever your statistician. And so, in such studies, one can never be sure that one's looking at causal associations or confounding. Despite that, uh, people like this kind of work. Um, and here we have a claim uh, that went under the BBC News, statin side effect risk uncovered. So they estimated that uh, statins were producing fewer cardiovascular events, fine, but that they were producing the same number of uh, people getting cataracts as are being prevented from having cardiovascular disease. Uh, so that's not good news. Um, they also talk about uh, other kinds of outcome, but, but to be producing a, such a big increase in the risk of cataract uh, would be a serious um, uh, side effect. But is it true? Well. If we take all of the observational studies, all of the studies like that one, but instead of selecting that particular one for emphasis because it's got some striking results, and we look at all of them, then there are six, six such studies, um, and there is absolutely no uh, overall effect on cataract or on other eye measures. So that study is a bit of an outlier. More importantly, if we go back to the randomized placebo controlled evidence, um, uh, so here is again the heart protection study which we ran, kind of the biggest of the trials. Um, if we look at the numbers of people who had a cataract reported or extracted, no significant difference. And the confidence interval for the estimate of the relative risk uh, for, um, completely refutes the size of the effect that was um, claimed by that uh, observational study. It was entirely inconsistent with it. So neither the observational, other observational studies, nor the randomized trials support that claim, but it gets publicized. So I think there's a very important principle here that typically when you start with a new uh, intervention, um, you, and you don't know it's effective, then you have a very much, you have a lower threshold for safety concerns. You, if there is some suggested evidence of, of an um, uh, adverse effect of the drug, then you would be more prone to stopping using that treatment, um, or stopping to test that treatment, uh, than uh, the situation where you know that it's effective. 
Once you've got to the situation where you've got really compelling evidence that it prevents heart attack deaths, prevents uh, heart attacks and strokes, then you need to have evidence that's equivalent in strength um, to make claims about side effects. Um, uh, and that's not what's happening at the moment. We're getting very weak evidence being used to make claims about side effects that are being used to counter very strong evidence about efficacy. Uh, and I think that's a problem. Moving on to uh, the other set of trials of cholesterol lowering, the ones of more intensive therapy versus less intensive therapy, this allowed us to, to, to test the observational epidemiology that I described at the very beginning of my talk uh, about whether um, very lowering low cholesterol would produce further reductions in risk. Now, in the trials of more versus less, uh, therapy, the average um, reduction in LDL cholesterol was half a millimole. But in order that you, you can compare the effect seen with the effect seen in the previous trials of statin versus control, where the reduction in cholesterol was one millimole, uh, I've adjusted this analysis to look at a per millimole reduction in trials where you compared people who got a statin to lower their LDL cholesterol with those who got more intensive statin therapy to lower their cholesterol further. And what we found was that reducing cholesterol further reduced risk further by the same amount per millimole. So we're going down that log linear association. Um, and because these people all had, were all already on a statin, they were starting at a relatively low level of cholesterol, and we were lowering it further. So even among people, who had an LDL cholesterol less than two, very few people in the UK population without a drug would be at that level. But even among those individuals, lowering their cholesterol lowered their risk. So if you had somebody who had a heart attack, who had multiple risk factors that put them at high risk of having another heart attack, then even if their LDL cholesterol was down in this lower range, it would be worthwhile lowering their cholesterol further. Um, either by intensifying their statin or uh, adding additional treatments. So to kind of summarize that part, we started here with relatively high cholesterol. On average, we lowered it by about a millimole and we produced a reduction of about one fifth uh, in the risk of coronary heart disease. We added another half a millimole reduction we produced another 15% relative risk. So you can see we're going down that log linear association. In randomized trials, the appropriate analysis is to compare all the people who were randomly allocated the treatment versus all the people who were randomly allocated the control, even if they don't take the treatment they're allocated. Because the randomization process creates two groups of people who differ randomly, only randomly from each other, in terms of all their characteristics, measured, unmeasured, unmeasurable. So that if you see a difference in outcome between the two groups, it's due to the fact you've given the treatment to one group and not to the other. But the problem with that is that if you have non-compliance, you will underestimate, even though you're unbiased in, in doing the assessment, you'll underestimate the effect of actually taking the treatment. Uh, because this is the average reduction in cholesterol between the two groups, when there was only, on average, about two-thirds compliance um, over the five years of the trial. So if you have full compliance, if you actually take the treatment, um, then you can get a bigger effect. So if we take um, statin, we get down to here. More intensive statin, we get down to here. So we have a relative risk of 0.78, 22%. A relative risk of 0.85, 15%. It's a multiplicative effect, so <clears throat> we have a relative risk of 0.66. So a one and a half millimole reduction in the trials is associated with 34%, a reduction of about one third in risk. But if you actually take the drug, then the regimens that we have, the statin regimens that we have, can quite easily lower your LDL by about two millimoles and lower your risk, consequently, by about 
The problem with more intensive therapy uh, is that you do increase the risk of myopathy. So, for example, if you go from 20 milligrams of simvastatin a day to 80 milligrams of simvastatin a day, you produce a tenfold increase in the risk of myopathy. You go from one per 10,000 per annum to about one per thousand per annum. Why would you do that? Well, 80 milligrams of simvastatin produces a bigger reduction in risk, and simvastatin is cheap and generic. More recently, uh, the newer, more potent statins have become generic, like atorvastatin, so you can get a, that big reduction in LDL cholesterol without um, increasing your risk of myopathy. So it is now quite easy to get this kind of reduction in LDL cholesterol with a statin. Even so, if you were high risk, if your curve was not here, but up here, you might be interested in lowering your cholesterol still further. So this is looking at it in absolute terms. Um, we could lower our LDL cholesterol by about 2 millivolts. Um, in the high-risk patients who are currently offer statins through the NHS, over a five-year period, it's going to prevent about 60 to 120 having a uh, first major vascular event. In the lower risk patients, it's of the order of 10 uh, to 27, 10 to 30 uh, major vascular events prevented uh, per thousand treated over a five year period. So, quite substantial absolute benefits um, if you give a potent statin and the patient actually takes it. <clears throat> There is an issue with the statins. Um, as I mentioned, if you go from, say, 20 milligrams of simvastatin to 80 milligrams of simvastatin, you'll produce a tenfold increase in your risk of um, myopathy. Uh, and you get a small, only a small incremental benefit from increasing your dose of statin. Uh, this kind of rule of six, that each doubling of the dose produces only about a 6% further reduction in LDL cholesterol. So if it was 30% with 10 milligrams, it would be 36% with 20 milligrams, etc., etc. So the question is, do we want to push the statin and get to doses that um, might cause myopathy? Or can we find other drugs that would produce further reductions in LDL cholesterol uh, and therefore produce further reductions in the risk of coronary artery disease? The Sensomide is one such drug. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't even get into the liver. It, it works within the gut. 